All right, guys, ahead of UFC 284, Makachev versus Volkanovski for the UFC lightweight belt. History-making stuff. And this has been a dream for us for a long time to sit down with this next man. By the way, presented by Manscaped, official electric trimmer of the UFC, the best play-by-play -play commentator, bar none. Wow. The prime professional, John Anik himself, to sit here with you, have a beer. Thank get you, brother. The piss. Cheers, man. gentlemen. Cheers, man. Welcome. Welcome. It's great to be with you, boys. We go way back. We've done a lot of conversations over the internet, so it's nice to finally sit down and chop it up with you, boys. And obviously, I got the the Perth trip in the rearview mirror, so it's good to be with you guys. We, I got here like two hours we ago. We send you twenty dollars. You ah. send us photos. It's been an ah. it's been a relationship that we've enjoyed through the internet. Now we thought we'd do it in person, and we do have cash with us for after the interview. So let's yeah. just. I know you want to stay out of the room if we don't, but let me, let me just quickly go back a little, man, because me and Casper want to congratulate you on an incredible journey. Well, thank you. Dude, I mean, joining back in 2011, now here we are in 2023, and I'm thinking about that UFC on Fox, Gilad vs. Miller event that you were a part of. Yeah. And now here we are in Perth sitting here with UFC 284 about to go down. I mean, I just want to, before we even get into all the other things, go back to that one event and your mindset then, if you ever thought you'd be sitting here in Perth, you know, more than 10 years later, doing this thing, calling it potentially one of the, you know, biggest fights down here. I guess I would probably say yes, because I wouldn't have left ESPN in 2011 if I didn't think that this was the wagon to hitch myself to. If I didn't think that I could eventually become the number one play-by-play -play guy for the UFC, I probably wouldn't have left ESPN. And candidly, when I think back to that time in 2011 and essentially how it went down, I haven't told the story all that many times publicly, but Shogun Hua is defending his title against John Jones in New Jersey. And I'm there covering the event for ESPN. And my now boss, Craig Borsari, approaches me in the back and he's like, hey, man, we're doubling our schedule next year from like 20 events to 40 events. And we have a play-by-play -play job for you. Have your agent call me on Monday. I didn't have a fucking agent. I'm like, yeah, you got it. He'll call you Monday. Hired an agent Sunday. He called the UFC Monday. But I knew then whatever they offered that I was going to sign. And I agreed verbally when we didn't even have a television partner. It ended up being, I think, Fuel TV, but it was rumored to be G4. I didn't care. I wanted to join the UFC. Obviously, I got the ascension to pay-per-view much sooner than I expected to happen. I thought it was hugely valuable that I got to do so many shows in Brazil and all over the world and really learn the bottom half of the roster and develop my skills so that when I got a chance to call the big fights, I was ready. Um, but the real freakout moment for me, boys, was Bellator season one in 09 because I called season one of Bellator. It was the first time I had called MMA. I'd done some boxing, but I got the call like three weeks out from Bjorn Rebney. They weren't planning on doing an English broadcast. They decided to at the last minute. It was only going to be Spanish. And um, I'm walking to that arena that night. I'm thinking, dude, you got the wrong guy, man. I've never <laughs> called an MMA fight in my life. But you what start a the feeling going into such a key event, right? And you, and you were doubting yourself. You're like, fuck. Well, and the doubts stop literally 30 seconds into the first fight, right? Because ultimately it's a sporting event and you know the sport well enough and you just kind of play to your strengths and you have an analyst there and when in doubt, you know, wins by submission. You don't have to say what it is, right? And I still subscribe to a lot of those theories today. But like what, when you guys were doing the first episode of Submission Radio, oh. do you remember that? When Yeah. I mean, when we do, just before this interview right now, we're like, oh, John, you got the wrong guys in your room here. <laughs> <laughs> we have no cash. Why, why, why did you think you were the wrong guy though? I didn't understand. Like, so... <clears throat> I had done a few play-by-play -play things, but not a lot. I did a lot of studio stuff, and it was at that time in 2009 when I was starting to realize I don't want to be a highlight machine for the rest of my life doing baseball highlights, showing up in a suit in a freezing cold studio Monday through Friday or Tuesday through Saturday, whatever it was. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do live events. So lo and behold, I get this call out of the blue from Bellator. I'm a full-time ESPN employee. They allow me to do that season. And essentially, I got that gig because as you guys know, I was hosting MMA Live. So I was like the de facto MMA guy at ESPN. But in terms of my play-by-play -play chops, I just didn't feel like I was qualified. I had probably called 12 to 15 boxing events, which gave me some confidence. But my nerves were through the roof. And uh, But again, you know, as soon as the broadcast starts, as soon as you crack a mic, um, it's live television. And I couldn't believe how quickly the nerves went away and how much fun I was having. And I knew really from that moment that, uh, that I needed to do live events, no more studio stuff. It's very like sink or swim. You either do great or you don't. So obviously like you, you did well. And I always think back to when you were saying like, oh, I had my time earlier. I, had, I got my ears and arms out of the way. 
And sometimes when we're doing stuff, recording, whatever, uh, 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 um, and I just think, man, there's just levels to this shit. Well, there, there's what we do, then there's what John does, you know what I mean? So you're, you're always that guy that we kind of look up to in that sense. And doing, doing the broadcasts for hours and hours and hours and making yeah. it so seamless, man, dude, massive hats off to you. Well, thank you guys. I've had a lot, and I really appreciate the words, and I've had a lot of time to develop my skills and I've had a lot of repetitions. You know, I just did a podcast with my twin brother called Annex Squared for the NFL season, right? And I say to people, you know, the only reason humbly that I'm better than him, right, is because I have a fucking 20 year head start on this guy, right? We have the same voice, the same genetics, the same mannerisms. We literally think the same, we sound the same, but I have 20 years of repetitions in this Mm, space. And the UFC- The reps. Exactly. It's a muscle. And the UFC broadcast is the single most challenging endeavor for a play-by-play man. I believe in professional sports. It's eight hours every time we crack a headset. Oftentimes it's 15 fights and 30 athletes. And uh, it's just a totally different endeavor than calling a basketball game or a football game. So I appreciate you saying that, but I really do have to mind, body, spirit, like get myself prepared for these marathons because it ain't fucking five hours. It ain't six. Like it's eight plus on a headset. What's the, while we're sinking piss, what's the craziest story of you like running and bolting to the toilet in between like ad reads? Have you ever almost not made it? Yeah, we've seen you do it yeah. through the media room once and you, yeah. were, you were like yeah. saying bolt, like you were like a flash over there. Like, is that you? Is that John? You're like, hello everyone. Like he, he managed to say hello to everyone as he ran through. George, yeah. George Costanza running like at the fire escape. Yeah, hey, get out. <laughs> Sometimes I'll see my broadcast partner go to the bathroom and I'm like, are you are you light on this fighter who's about to walk? Is that why you're taking a piss right now? You don't have enough stuff on this fighter? Where are we going, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But no, there. I can't remember exactly who was fighting, but I went to a public restroom, I think in Brazil, and it was just crowded and I couldn't get out of there. And so I missed a so fighter pub- walk. Like public, the, the fans are there. Oftentimes and I'm going to a public out. restroom, yeah. Um, but, they, are they like, can I get a photo? And you're like, dude, I'm working. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they'll sprint back with me and uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, if you want to take a photo here at the urinal, I guess we could do that. <laughs> so but, people have heard they're going to be waiting in the bathroom for you yeah, Sunday. Yeah, no, I'm ready for it. The bathroom <laughs> photos are, uh, leave a little bit to be desired. But no, I mean, it's, uh, it's something like for me, I've actually, I mean, this is going to sound crazy, but I fucking like condition my bladder to not have to piss for hours on end because when we're on pay-per-view, as you guys know, there are no commercials. So my broadcast partners will get a chance to get up and take a piss. But uh, more often than not, once that pay-per-view starts, I'm, I'm locked in. So. Wow. Man, eight hours, the bathroom thing aside, like what is, what is the moment that stands out to you over all these years? Um, like something that went wrong that you had to sort of deal with last minute, you know, one of your partners not being able to do something, you're having to step up. What's one of the most challenging things or like the funniest kind of interesting, most interesting story that stands out to you in those situations? You know, we've had a lot of things. We've had some wardrobe things with Daniel Cormier. I remember when my wardrobe didn't show up <clears throat> in Halifax and I had to somehow uh, scramble to like get a suit. Yeah. You know, oftentimes I'll have nightmares on airplanes that I lose my fighter cards. That's my biggest fear is yeah. that like I lose all of my handwritten prep because it's obviously not backed up. But thankfully there haven't been too many nightmarish situations. I will tell you guys, for the last pay-per-view in New York City last year, that's as sick as I have ever been for a live event. So modern medicine is a powerful right. thing. Uh, Adesanya and Pereira. Yeah, I was I was death. I mean, and when I have a late pay-per-view start as we do on the East Coast, like I'll prep a little bit during that day. Dude, I couldn't do anything. I was dead to the world. My twin brother was there with me for moral support, thank God. Um, but modern medicine. I know. Yeah. Should, yeah. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, modern medicine, I had three powerful pills and it really carried me through but that was uh because you you never want to be less than 100 percent for this type of initiative and uh needless to say last november i was hurting for certain so like there's no not doing it is obviously not an option but do you go like how do i do this like so i just had a conversation it's funny you say that with my producer zach candido about like what is the protocol for this right because if you remember that week i'm filling in for dana white at the press conference Mm. 10 athletes next to me who all need to go compete. So I'm, I'm, I call my boss after the event. I said, I just want to let you know, I know you knew how sick I was on Saturday, but like, am I supposed to like bang out of the press conference and not do the weigh in? And he's like, yeah, dude, like you're supposed to bang out of everything that isn't the show. Forget about the shoulder programming and get yourself healthy. But 
Not unlike I feel like I'm the last line of defense when it comes to like right before the broadcast, making sure our scripts are all aligned. Like I feel like I got to show up like in any condition pretty much. And um, that's why the COVID climate, I think, provided some challenges. You know, like I would be more inclined to not take a COVID test as opposed to like not showing up here, you know, Mm -hmm. if I didn't feel 100 percent. But no, we basically adopt the philosophy that however we feel, we just kind of got to go. What's something about your prep that uh, people may not know or, or might surprise people? Well, I think the endless nature of it, when I say that if all of a sudden the arena had a blackout and the fight card got delayed four hours, like I wouldn't be dicking around like there's something else on Elvis Brenner that I can probably chase. You know, there, I'm pulled in a lot of different directions during these fight weeks. And you guys are obviously a big priority for me this week. Um, <clears throat> but if I wasn't with you guys, that's 40 minutes or so that could be devoted to a yeah. fighter. You know, I have a wine tasting and a big ordeal here in Perth over six hours on Thursday. Perhaps my time would be better spent researching fighters. You know hey, what I mean? Are you saying that we you, you should be doing this interview? <laughs> this guy, this guy's going to get me in trouble. You know, Perhaps you guys shouldn't be here. <laughs> did we ruin the broadcast you did. for the Sunday? Dennis, you ruined the whole thing. <laughs> but I would say that I I would put my preparation up against anyone's. And, you know, I want to prepare more than the number two guy. And I treat every show like it's my last, as trite as that sounds. And I have so much experience and time spent educationally, like writing and writing for television that I really take a lot of time when it comes to my writing. Not necessarily the pay-per-view open because that's memorized and sometimes I'll go off the cuff, but the locker rooms, like coming up next, right? A lot of people feel like we just show up and talk. And yeah, I could just wing the locker rooms, right? But that gives me a real opportunity to give a nugget nugget that a fighter provided in the fighter meeting and work it in with creative writing and make it just optimal for the viewer. So perhaps I take the job too seriously at times, but I would, I guess I would say, because it's a good question, I would say, you know, just using my writing chops and all the experience I've accrued as a writer um, and then just, just diving in and using every possible hour I have when I'm not on submission radio. <laughs> Do you, I can't stand watching back our content and I'm not sure whether if it's any good or if it's because I can't look at myself or hear my own voice. What do you like? Because when I hear your voice, I'm like, am I watching the UFC right now? Like it's hard for me to be in a conversation with you because your voice is so basically connected now with the UFC. It's iconic. But what do you think of your own voice when you hear back? So it sounds like my twin brother to me, if I'm being honest. My voice is a little bit deeper. It's been damaged by voicing video games and other things where I haven't used my diaphragm properly. So I feel like at some point I'm going to have some vocal issues. Um, But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's there's just so many different things that uh, that go into this job. I lost my train of thought. What were we talking about? Well, can you hear yourself back? Like, oh yeah. Can you say that's like like, the? This is good because I can't. I can't watch. That's the number one inconvenient truth, right? I tell Kenny Florian, my podcast partner, this all the time. He hasn't listened back to one of our shows other than clips. We've done 385 shows. And it's my least favorite thing to do, right? Like even this Alexander Volkanovsky essay that I was really proud of, when I hear the final version, like I didn't think I sounded great, you know? But you, you got to do it. Better, right? Yeah, it just it sounded a little canned and just not my best work. But, you know, I guess the producers were happy with it to whatever degree, but you have to do it, right? Like you guys should be listening back to almost every show you do. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like self-serving and it is self-serving in some way, but... How are you going to get any better if you don't listen yeah. to yourself? You know, I have a lot of verbal crutches still. My chief verbal crutch is, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if I do my podcast when I'm stoned, I say, you know, probably 75 times. When I do it sober, maybe three times. So I'm still working. And one thing that finally I feel like I've mastered over the last two years is pausing on my podcast. I used to say, um, or, you know, now I pause. To the Barack Obama. The Barack Obama approach the pausing we say a lot in other words like that <laughs> crutch words <laughs> yeah, right. uh, you know, we'll get cancelled but we come back anyway so <laughs> you know you know what you remind me of though like you remind me of like kind of like the old pro wrestlers where you go town to town it's an endless schedule you work hard you know what i mean you see so many towns uh, i'm curious though like you got to give us some some uh, road stories some of the craziest shit you've seen. You're yeah. in all sorts of oh. different hotels. Don't get canceled now, John. Yeah, I'll but try don't not forget, to. It's pretty unsensitive. You can say yeah. whatever you want. No, well, so I remember when we were in 2013, we're in Joinville, Jaraguá do Sul, Brazil. And I've heard of that. 
the arena is like fucking rat infested, like six days out. And it's like, how is Vitor Belfort going to walk through that hallway on Saturday night? And yet somehow, miraculously, they clean out this venue. But dude, I mean, I've done 27 shows in Brazil. We went to a lot of dumps, a lot of, you know, non-climate controlled venues with just, you know, pavement cedars and no seats and Leota Machida's walking out at 3.40 in the morning and these fans are fanning themselves and falling asleep. I mean, there have been some crazy, crazy fight atmospheres. I was actually in a car chase in Brazil. It was what? just me and the driver and he cut somebody off and this guy was chasing him. He told me to fucking get down in the back, you know, and we Were get to the hotel. Someone was going to like shoot through the, the windows or something? You know, I, I, I was, I guess I was not as worried as I should have been. It was very early on in my UFC career, but when we got to the hotel, he was like, please don't tell anybody that this happened, you know? And there have been some crazy, crazy situations, but um, yeah, it's given me an opportunity, obviously, to travel the world and meet people like you and come to a place like Australia eight times where otherwise I probably never would have made it here. So um, I'm very grateful and trying to lean into that gratitude, but a hundred nights a year away from my children is, is getting old, you know? Do you ever get a chance to enjoy yourself afterwards, like have a few beers, maybe hang around some of the celebrities or the people that are fans of yours, the fans of the UFC? Because I imagine the, there's the, uh, you get that adrenaline rush after the show. Yeah. So you're not going to yeah. bed. You oh, want to no go way. Out, you want to celebrate. Yeah. Do you have any crazy sort of, hey, maybe I went a little too far on this night here after a big event? You know, there was a pay-per-view last year where I found myself in a Vegas nightclub yeah. and I was lathered and I'm like dancing and I'm 44 years old and I'm like, what am I doing? You know, like, am I like catching and releasing women? What am I doing tonight? You know, like, what are we doing? So, but I sort of, after that, I was like, you know what? That's what I should be doing after every pay-per-view, to your point, is like to live it up. And exactly, instead of flying out on the red eye and I'm going to be dead to the world and dead to my kids anyway, might as well enjoy it a little bit. But certainly like in places like Brazil, we'll have like the whole next day because we can't get out of there and that'll be enjoyable. And in Australia, you know, candidly, I'm not just saying it because I'm here with you guys, but like I feel a really close kinship with the Aussie fans. So I will do an appearance here after the ceremonial weigh-in, which I would never, ever, ever do almost anywhere else in the world because I'm back in my room banging keys. But I feel like it's the only way to give back other than having my podcast be- What does that mean? Type okay, on the cool, cool. All right, yeah. just checking that. That's my whole life is fucking banging keys. Like, there's so much okay. writing for this job, it's crazy. So that's yeah, all I do. Yeah, um, yeah, I got but I feel the fans, guys like you two, have just been so supportive that I want to give back. Like, and this is how I can give back and doing an appearance is how I can give back. I mean, who's using my two, two tickets in Perth? A fan who couldn't get any. You know what I mean? Right. Like, this has been one of the hardest tickets of all time in UFC history. I wish we had 25,000 and not mm -hmm. 15,000 seats. But um, yeah, we've been to a lot of special places and, um, you know, hopefully many more to come. Were you giving away your tickets? I remember when you were telling us like you would uh, even like give random fans money sometimes. Like people would DM you and they'd be like, oh, I, I actually know, gave a fighter a hundred bucks once. He took me up on it. Jared Gooden. Hope I'm not outing him. Wow. For, for what? We were on our Zoom fighter meeting and he was complaining about money. And I was like, dude, I'll give you a hundred bucks at the weigh-in. Comes up to me at the weigh-in. Ask for the money. God love him, you know. But um, yeah, just randomly sometimes. Like, yeah. Oh, I was ready. I signed the fucking C note. I didn't pay him in twenties. <laughs> I signed a one hundred dollar bill. I was ready to go. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, there have been times where like a fan who I can tell is like legitimately die hard and just up against it with life circumstance. And yeah, I just make a quick random $50 donation. And it, it really, I think sometimes it, they consider the source and they're like, wow, John Anik just fucking took five minutes out of his day to send yeah, me $50 yeah, yeah. more than the monetary yeah. gain, you know? Um, but I don't, you know, like I don't give my tickets away to a fan and publicize it because I want good publicity. It's that I want people to know that, you know, if like this person reached out to me and said something so thoughtful and I was like, what can I do other than write thank you? you know, oh, I'll give her my tickets, you know? You can return kindness with kindness and that's why I sort of wanted to put that act out there for people to see that like, hey, you know what? All you fucking trolls out there, like maybe write to someone like, hey, I appreciate your hard work. You might get free tickets to an event. Yeah, you know? well, you, you reward, you're rewarding the kindness as opposed to biting on the, the, the negativity. And then also, as far as like your kinship with Australia, like no one pronounces Melbourne better than you. Huh. You pronounce it better than more than the most Melbournians. So I think that's another reason of like, you know, why people love you, you putting in the hard work. I gotta ask, cause I know you got another appointment in a second. Uh, I'm curious, after seeing like 
This weekend, we've got the massive fight. After seeing Alex Volkanovsky so many times, you've seen his early fights as well here in Australia. I wonder what's something that you notice about him that maybe people don't pick up watching through TV? Because watching up close is very different to watching it on TV. So we had Severe MMA's Sean Sheehan on our podcast last week, and he okay. compared Alexander Volkanovsky to Demetrius Johnson at just in his ability to just do everything without really thinking in there, just instinctually on a totally different level. One thing that I have said about Alexander on the broadcast in the past is that it's almost like a little bit Matrix-like, or when people talk about microdosing on mushrooms, how everything slows down for them, and that some kickboxers actually have competed while microdosing on mushrooms, but everything slows down for him, and it seems like visually... And mentally, he knows what's coming before the opponent starts to engage. And it's crazy. Like the Demetrius Johnson comparisons are absolutely apt. And I don't think it's a stretch when guys like Michael Chiesa say that if he beats Islam Makhachev, he is the greatest of all time, Sur superseding John Jones. Well, I have to see the way this fight plays out, but my gosh, I mean, how could you argue with that? And we put Habib Nurmagomedov's 29-0 on a pedestal, and rightfully so. But Alexander Volkanovsky has essentially done the same thing with this 22 fight winning streak with a harder strength of schedule, right? His only pro loss is up two weight classes at 170 pounds. So he probably already should have been in these GOAT type conversations. It's nice for him to get his flowers. And um, I'm happy to be here for the athletes. I really am. I mean, it's a far trek, but uh, I wouldn't miss this show for the world. I mean, this is a huge, huge, this is one of the biggest singular fights that I will have ever called. Like, there's no doubt about it. I'm stunned DC's missing this one. Maybe it's because he's got a teammate in the race or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, I want to know, just, just to even things out a little with Islam, not, not everybody would come down to Perth to fight Alex. Uh, there's a lot on the line for him. He's got more to lose than Alex, really, because if he goes out there and loses, you know, it's going to really sort of hurt things for him, whereas he could be fighting somewhere closer to home against maybe another opponent and sort of not have to deal with some of the stuff that people deal with when they come down here. So I wonder... Just two things. Number one, your thoughts on Islam actually taking this fight, coming to Perth, taking on this challenge. And number two, this you just mentioned how big this fight is, the stakes in this fight. When was the last time you remember the stakes being so high in the UFC fight? Because not only do you have the title for title, but you also have the pan for pan, but then you also have these guys in their prime. Well, I feel like we don't get these that, that kind yeah. of those kind of factors. There's either. no point of comparison. I mean, back in the day, Lorenzo Fertitta would talk about George St. Pierre versus Anderson Silva, and obviously that fight never came to mm -hmm. fruition. We've never had in the men's game number one versus number two in the pound for pound race going head to head. We had Cyborg and Amanda Nunes. You could say they were number one and number two. But Islam Akhachev deserves a lot of credit. Not so much for coming to Perth, you know. I mean, I I like that he'll do that. You know, I like that certain guys are willing to go into the belly of the beast and some people like to do that, but I think he deserves the most credit and this will be reflected in my pay-per-view open. I'm not sure there's ever been a fighter who had more pressure nor expectation to become a UFC champion than Islam Akhashab. I actually think there was more pressure on him than Khabib because even before Khabib was defending the title, Abdulman Abner Magomedov was saying, oh, and when Khabib's done, it's gonna be Islam, right? And when he lost to Adriano Martins in his second UFC fight, even back then, we knew he was the goods. And that was a stunner even back then. So to respond to that setback so early in his UFC career, rip off 10 straight wins. And again, I just don't know that there's ever been an athlete who, who so much has been expected of in the UFC. And uh, the numbers, like I try not to lean too much into the stats, but dude, like... He's got all these crazy lightweight records and he hasn't even defended the title just in terms of like significant strike differential and takedown accuracy. He's like highest all time, highest all time. It's crazy. And obviously he's putting guys away now. So um, it's a fascinating fight. I think the betting line is way out of whack. To me, if Volkanovski wins, this would not be a top 200 upset in UFC history. It wouldn't be a top 500 upset in UFC history. Not to say that he shouldn't be the underdog at maybe like plus 180, but plus 310 is totally crazy. And if he's the consensus number one pound for pound fighter in the world, there's no real upset, you know? Yeah. I'm excited to see what he can do with the challenge. I never thought of the GSP Anderson Silva yeah. comparison, but that's a very good point. It's like, we didn't get that, but we're getting this. 
And then another thing is like, it's always crazy when people do something for so long and then eventually it pays off. Like, and it, you think it back to like, when you were doing this, when you were young, you probably didn't see the light. You didn't think you'd ever be in this position. I always think back to like Modern Family, the girl, the, the mum, like she was the hot girl in, yeah. uh, what was it, Billy Madison or, yeah, or Happy yeah, yeah. Gilmore or whatever it was. Yeah, that was in the 90s. And then like, what, 10, 20 years later, she landed in Modern Family. And you're like, imagine those years where you're like, will I ever make it again? You see the pictures of like Habib and Islam, they're training, they're so young. They didn't know that they'd be yeah. in this position, making a living off it, making money. So. Unbelievable. Have you guys had the fighters meeting yet by any chance? Tomorrow morning. Okay, so obviously you're not gonna give us the answers to what they're gonna say, nor would we expect it. But what are you most curious about in the fighters meeting? When you go in there, like what are you looking for? So it really depends, right? I try to have a few thoughtful questions for each athlete and candidly try to give them something that they haven't been asked before. I do have a special gift for Volkanovski that I wish I could reveal on Submission Radio, but we're gonna hold it, I have a gift for him to give to him in the fighter wow. meeting tomorrow. So that's what I'm most excited about. No one really about. watches this, John. <laughs> yeah. So be my mom. Yeah, that be is not partner. true. That is not true. <laughs> hey, what, you got eight sponsors now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> None of them watch the show though. <laughs> but you know, like we'll sit down with some UFC newcomers. Oftentimes on these pay-per-views we'll have several fighters making their UFC debut because they want to showcase these athletes on a, on a numbered card. So. I think we had six UFC newcomers on last pay-per-view. We got five, so I'll be sitting down with a lot of those fighters. So I'm excited to sort of get their temper and tempo and see where they're at. Obviously, visually, hopefully Volkanovski shows up and it isn't over Zoom, so I can actually lay eyes on right. the thickness in person. And um, you know, I like, guess do, do you look for things in there like for your oh own yeah <clears throat> hand size like okay <clears throat> is a huge thing for me. Um, hopefully, that's not too graphic, but. No. I mean, dude, like, obviously much has been made of Montel Jackson, UFC Bantamweight, whose hands are bigger than Francis Ngannou's, right? Yeah. It's crazy. But, <clears throat> dude, like, a lot of these guys have hands that you really don't want to get hit by, you know? And then other guys will have these tiny Floyd Mayweather mitts, and you're just thinking, how do you yeah. crack anybody with those, you know? So, yeah, there's always things that you can pick up on. And, um, candidly, sometimes... Men and women just don't want to be there. And so we'll expedite the process a little bit, you know? I mean, I, there was one fighter meeting where I say, hey, if you don't want to be here, man, you know? Like, and sometimes they get tense, tense depending on, you know, their pre-existing relationships that a lot of us have. And, um, you know, sometimes, obviously, you know, like Tony Ferguson and Daniel Cormier, for obvious reasons, have had a little bit of a... Tony and I... I might be a bit like defense in these meetings. Well, to, you know, Tony at one point and... I love Tony Ferguson to yeah, death, but at one point he was like, how about someone other than Anna? Cause he doesn't seem like he fucking wants to be here today. And I'm like, Tony, you're my man. What? Like what? Like oh, totally out of the blue, you know? Yeah. So there have been instances that we've had to navigate and um, you know, there'll be times where maybe something will happen. Like when Lauren Murphy fought Valentina Shevchenko, right? We had to be critical on that broadcast. And even for me as the play-by-play -play guy, you know, maybe bleeding a little bit into analysis to be critical. I was really looking forward to sitting down with Lauren for her next fight, just to sort of clear the air a little bit, because I can send her a message on social media. And even in her last fight against Jessica Andrade, had to be critical again. And, um, you know, but thankfully, like, there's always a, a connection there. And um, Do they yeah. reach out to you? Like, yeah. do you ever give yeah. DMs like, hey, John, you really yeah. annoyed me on that yeah. one? Yeah. So like, well, I was filled in on the weigh-in show in, in Rio and Terrence McKinney reached out to me after the weigh-in show. I think his coaches were upset that I mentioned Rick Little on the weigh-in show. All I said on the weigh-in show was that Rick Little said Terrence McKinney was the single most talented guy to have ever walked in his gym. I didn't say Rick Little was still coaching him, right? Yeah, yeah, but I didn't put over his coach at the time, which I understand. So I went to great lengths on Saturday night to, uh, to put over his coach. So, um, but you know, there have been like, I remember when we were all staying at that residence inn in Vegas and some coach came up to me after the fight, gets up in my face like, hey, sorry, your guy didn't win tonight. And I was just like, dude, where is this coming from? So you're not gonna please everyone. My skin is thicker now than it was, you know, 10 years ago. And um, obviously if there's grounds for me to apologize for something, I certainly am the first to do so. so. I think like your ability to take criticism as well is like pretty unmatched. You do a great job of that. I like your story about uh, the late, great Josh Saman and how he criticized you for your pronunciation. Not of, me, of but his, yeah. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah. But it was just kind of like something that, um, I don't know, kind of clicked with you as well. And like, sometimes you take these things as like, you know, lessons of like moving forward. And I wonder, because now you're the veteran, do you ever like, 
I don't know, speak to some of the other, like say fighters turned commentators and like give give criticism or tell them like, hey man, listen, this is something that you could be doing better. Or cause I imagine like when you're spending that many hours with like some of these guys, you bond like brothers, right? And oh, then you yeah. can also kind of like step on each other's toes kind of thing. I wonder how that all works. Yeah, I mean, Anthony Smith and Brian Stan are probably the only broadcast partners of mine that have told me that I make them better and ask me for advice as to how they can get better. Obviously, Dominic Cruz is a dear friend and we've leaned on each other a lot, but I take this job so seriously because this is the soundtrack of not only these people's professional lives, but they are gonna show these fights to so many people in their lives, their children who can't watch them because they're too young or whatever. So it is incumbent upon us to try to be accurate, to be complimentary, to pronounce their names right. You know, it's okay on the time. So so for Josh Saman to make it to the UFC and be called Josh Salmon, right? Like his whole family's watching and they're calling him Salmon. That's yeah. not what you're looking for, you know? So that obviously resonated with me. Um, and I know Adesanya gets pronounced in a bunch of different ways. We actually had a conversation with Izzy and his father about this like four years ago. Yeah. And that's when the decision was made collectively with Izzy and his dad to go with Adesanya on broadcast. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I try to get it right. Obviously, you know, the custody battle thing that I mentioned is something that I've sort of had to deal with. And, um, but that's I, part of the story, man. Well, yeah, I regretted the verbiage and we happen to have two fighters who are being prevented from seeing their sons and they were fighting each other. And I wrongfully tied them together and then our sport moved so quickly i didn't have the time and it just became an avalanche and um but it is it is what it is it's like there's there's nothing i can i we're judged on every utterance over eight hours yeah. there's nothing we can do everything's you know? a meme it is what it is and i what i don't like is when someone will say oh you made up for it with that leon edwards knockout call i'm not trying to make up for anything and candidly i stand by the fucking custody battle call i don't stand by the verbiage used but ultimately yeah. Chris Gutierrez wins the fight. He's balling with Joe Rogan. So if I don't mention his son, why is he balling? Yeah. Well, Joe can get the answer, but now the viewers know. He's balling because his ex is preventing him from seeing his son. Yeah. Dude, last one and we'll let you go. So you're meeting your producer downstairs. Just quickly, a friend of Ab's mutual friend, Laura Sanko, yeah. made history the other weekend. As we wrap up, what did it mean for you as someone who's been around her to see her get her first moment last the other weekend and- make history. So she has been as supportive publicly of me as any of my colleagues. And it is so nice to see her get her flowers. I was hoping that I would get the chance to actually work with her when she uh, when she made that history. But she really does what an analyst is supposed to do when it comes to giving you the why and the how. You know, she's not necessarily calling out strikes like a play-by-play -play guy would. And her grappling analysis is outstanding. I would put it up against any of the men or any of the analysts that we have going. So I'm really happy she got her shot. And what I said to her way back when in the day, I said, two things are going to reign supreme. Television performance and MMA analytics, right? It doesn't matter that you're want to know as a pro. It's nice that you're pretty, but that really doesn't matter. You have comedic value, comedic timing, MMA analytics, and television performance, right? Like Angela Hill got some time on TV. She's pretty good, right? But the reason why Laura Sanko would get the opportunity over someone like Angela Hill, who's fought over 20 times in the UFC, is television performance, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy for Laura, and um, I do think you'll see her on a pay-per-view with us before it's all said and done. I really do. So. All right. Well, I think we need to finish with the cheers to everybody getting ready to potentially meet John Anik in the bathroom on Sunday. Yeah. Make sure to stay Coffee there. Coffee and day. combat and punch. Thank you so much for hey, joining us, I man. wish we had longer. I appreciate you boys more than you know. Thank you for Thank coming Thank you so up. much. Thank it's an honor for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.